Okay, good morning and welcome to Farm Credit East um, Agricultural Economic Outlook and Ag Labor Update webinar. Um, just a few tech notes before we begin. All attendees will be muted throughout the presentation. Every once in a while, be sure to tap your mouse so that your screen does not go to sleep during the presentation. There will be a time for questions and answers at the end of each presentation. Questions can be text chatted in at any point during the presentation and they will then be asked of the presenter at the completion of their presentation. To send in your question, click on the red arrow to expand the GoToWebinar control panel. This arrow is typically found in the upper right hand corner of your screen. You will then see a text box where you can type in your question and send it in. Finally, a recording of today's presentation will be available on farmcredities.com slash webinars for playback at a later time. If you are having trouble accessing this recording, please contact Christy Schmidt at 1-800-562 2235. Um, without further ado, I'll introduce Jim Putnam, Executive Vice President of Farm Credit East, who will introduce our speakers. Go ahead, Jim. Good morning. I uh, really appreciate your joining us on this uh, snowy morning here in the uh, much of the Northeast. I don't know how far uh, west the storm goes, uh, whether it's all the way out to uh, Chautauqua County in New York State, but certainly a uh, a uh, big storm, and uh, we, we uh, really appreciate your being uh, with us this morning uh, as the snow falls outside. Uh, we, uh, on behalf of the entire Farm Credit East team, uh, we are pleased to bring you two outstanding speakers this morning on uh, different topics, and I'm going to introduce them uh, individually uh, when it's their turn to speak. So uh, again, I want to echo Chris's comment. We encourage uh, that you text chat questions in uh, using the uh, box in the GoToWebinar uh, software program in front of you. Uh, and we will try to address those uh, questions with the speakers uh, at the conclusion of their talk, uh, as time permits, of course. So uh, please do that. Uh, so with no further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Terry Barr. Uh, he is a uh, repeat uh, speaker for us and I truly believe is the best all-around uh, agricultural economist kind of covering our whole industry uh, from both a national and global uh, perspective. And we always uh, learn a lot by listening to uh, Terry. His biography is in front of you on the screen. I'm not going to go into all of that, but uh, we were very pleased several years ago uh, when he retired from the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives where we uh, had known him well uh, and went to work with CoBank uh, in their Knowledge Exchange Division as Senior Director. So uh, went from uh, being uh, part of a closely affiliated organization where a member of uh, NCFC uh, over to uh, being a uh, part of the team with our uh, wholesale bank partner within the farm credit system, CoBank, of course. So with no further ado, uh, we welcome you uh, to this webinar and look forward to uh, what you have to share with us this morning, Terry. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate the, the invitation, the opportunity, and I appreciate people taking time from their uh, uh, busy schedules to uh, uh, have a little discussion about where this economy is going and where, what the implications are for agriculture. You know, a lot of change is coming, uh, and, and I think to some degree the crystal ball is a little hazy. We've just passed the farm bill, so uh, obviously there's, there, are, there are things yet to be uh, settled on that will have implications for many sectors of agriculture. But, but I think the big key at this point in time really is to, to recognize that, we're, that we're, we are in an adjustment period. And this slide just shows you the, the ag commodity picture um, in terms of uh, kind of a historical perspective. I always like to, to uh, kind of remember where we were. It kind of gives us some indication of, of where we might be going and so forth. And, and uh, uh, we can remember the 70s and the, and the, and the nearly a tripling in, in, uh, in commodity prices. And then we, we kind of stayed in that banner for, for really almost 30 years with a lot of fluctuations around it, and largely weather-driven, but, but uh, uh, different episodes. But we still kind of settled out at, the, at similar type price levels. And then 
0408 over the last 10 years, we really had a lot of volatility in agriculture. We do seem to have found a, a kind of another plateau on prices. We don't quite know where it's going to settle out yet. Uh, <clears throat> clearly, uh, Mother Nature and this global economic adjustments that are ahead of us are, are going to drive the market and so forth. And, and, and we can see that period from 04 to 08 where we had this rising global middle class that really drove all commodity prices, whether it's ag or raw materials and so forth, substantially higher. And then a lot of volatility around the uh, financial turmoil um, coming out of Lehman Brothers. Uh, and now we're into question mark here in terms of where are we going to settle out? Where's that new kind of plateau out uh, that we're going to kind of fluctuate around over the next five years or decades, depending on uh, how things evolve and so forth? Uh, we're in that transition phase of a lot of things that are likely to uh, impact the, uh, the direction that we're, go we're going to be going in and so forth. Uh, a lot of different factors at play here in terms of, of looking back, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, from the irrational exuberance of the 04-08 period to the financial turmoil of the 09-13 to 13 period, uh, you can see some of the factors that, that were uh, involved and so forth. Biofuels growth was very big during that 2008 period where agriculture had not only a rising biofuels market but a strong global market, so a big rising middle class and so forth. Um, that was really what brought us to a new, a new level of prices. Uh, during the financial turmoil, we began to have uh, uh, a lot of volatility in grain production across the world. That really kind of insulated agriculture to some degree from the impacts of the financial crisis. It put a lot of stress on the livestock and dairy side, obviously, uh, during that period of time. Uh, but I think the important thing to remember at this point in time when you look at this slide is throughout the last decade, we have, a, have had a combination of very low interest rates and aggressive fiscal spending, fiscal deficits across the globe. So uh, large injections of liquidity, uh, very affordable uh, interest rate picture has been with us for the past decade. And I think going forward, uh, we're going to be talking about a kind of a different environment that's going to have to be dealt with and so forth. So it's going to be a more fiscal austerity, whether you're talking about Europe or the U.S., whether you're, <clears throat> it's going to mean uh, less global liquidity. We're going to see these central banks go the other way uh, in terms of trying to draw out some of that liquidity that they've injected, uh, trying to limit the inflationary pressures and so forth. Obviously, China's slowing down a little bit now, uh, and that takes another major player out. So the uh, U.S. economy seems to be coming back, seems to be getting some momentum at least. Uh, the biofuel side is really kind of plateaued at this point, and we've got a new energy paradigm to deal with. So we're beginning to see grain inventories build. Uh, we're beginning to see some kind of a realignment occurring. Uh, the protein and dairy side obviously is enjoying very good margins and so forth, uh, but there's still a lot of price volatility, still a lot of uncertainty out there that has to be coped with, uh, but it's going to be trying to cope with that environment uh, in a different interest rate regime than what we've seen perhaps over for the last uh, 10 years. Global economic growth, uh, as you can see from this slide, during that 0408 period, average economic growth in the world was 4.5%. Uh, the next five years, it was about 2.9 because of that severe recession and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> now we seem to be kind of over that 3% threshold, but not quite to the 4% uh, with a lot of uncertainty in terms of what's going to drive this global economy forward. The other thing to remember from this slide, of course, is to see that the advanced economies are a smaller and smaller contributor uh, to global growth. And this slide simply shows where growth is coming from on a global basis, and those blue bars are consistently smaller than where they were from the from the left-hand side of the slide and so forth. It just says this, this global economy is going to be driven by outside the advanced economies go forward. Um, that's an important recognition in terms of, of uh, uh, the volatility we might see ahead of us. Uh, this slide's got a lot of numbers on it, but the one thing I wanted to point out was when we talk about an improving global economy, going from maybe a 3% growth rate in, in 2013 to a to a 3.7 or a 4 percent growth rate. This time, it's all hinged on the advanced economies. There is no expectation that the emerging markets are going to be surging forward in growth. The expectation is the U.S. economy is going to be 
moving up towards the 3% growth pattern. Europe's going to come out of its recession. Uh, Japan's going to continue to grow. Uh, that's kind of the, the scenario that supports the global economy at this point in time. Uh, so I think now that the eyes turn towards uh, can these advanced economies maintain any momentum uh, going forward, and with also an eye on China, of course, in terms of, of how far, how, how slow do they move going forward. Uh, when you look at the global marketplace today, I really kind of call it a kick the can global marketplace. And the reason for that is it seems to me when I go around and look at what everybody's doing in terms of adjustments, we're not seeing the adjustments on a structural basis occurring. We're, we're seeing a lot of uh, political kicking of the can down the road, whether you talk about the U.S. or Europe or Japan and so forth. The hard, hard decisions on structural reforms are still ahead of us. Uh, and that really causes a concern with regard to how rapidly uh, we can see a recovery in, in, in global growth and global demand on a consistent basis. Europe's still facing debt and deficit issues. Uh, Merkel has been reelected in Germany. Uh, that really promises the ability to move forward. Uh, the European Central Bank you know, promises to do whatever it takes to get uh, Europe realigned and so forth. But the reality is they've still got to transform themselves from a monetary union to a banking union uh, <clears throat> to a fiscal union and so forth before they can really move forward. Uh, and that's probably going to take another two to three years and so forth before they're going to be able to break out of the malaise uh, that they're currently in. When you look at Japan, uh, Japan obviously has devalued their currency very aggressively over the past year or so, uh, trying to break their economy out of stagnation. Uh, they've been successful in the short term. Uh, but uh, the last phase of this strategy, uh, devalue the currency, go to quantitative easing in their banking system. The next phase of that uh, uh, transition was to do structural reforms within their economy uh, to get it going again and so forth. And so the hard part is still ahead of them. Uh, a lot of room for missteps here in terms of trying to reform some, some uh, long-held traditions within their economy and so forth. When you look at China, obviously they have new leadership. They have a new reform agenda. Uh, they're trying to transition themselves from, from an export dependency to uh, more driven by the consumer sector. Uh, we'll see how fast they're able to achieve that and so forth. They do have a vulnerable shadow banking system uh, that they're trying to bring to heel and so forth. Uh, but each time they try to address that issue and tighten up on the monetary side, uh, it slows their growth rates down. So I think. Uh, they have work to do as well going forward in terms of uh, implementing structural reform. Uh, the emerging markets have, come, of course, been on the headlines recently and so forth. Uh, obviously, their trade flows have slowed because the advanced economies have been weak and so forth. But more importantly, their capital flows have slowed. And, and, and I think what you're seeing now is capitals coming back to the advanced economies. Uh, these emerging markets are now running. Uh, significant current account deficits, and you've seen sharp corrections in their currency as, as a result of that. Uh, elections will occur in six of the largest uh, emerging markets. Uh, and so that political turmoil along with the economic turmoil uh, has led to a lot of concern about kind of a contagion risk to these emerging markets. So my guess is this will be a difficult year for most of these emerging markets going forward until we see a solid recovery uh, in the advanced economies. In the U.S., again, it does appear there's some momentum for growth in, in the U.S. economy going into 2014. The debt and deficit debate really has now shifted to 2015 and beyond. The congressional elections really are taking over. Uh, you witnessed the uh, fairly benign uh, passage of the, uh, of the debt ceiling uh, with little theater and so forth, and I think that's an indication that, that, that this Congress is not going to tackle anything uh, that uh, of substance uh, during this session and so forth, immigration, health care, and trade. I think there will be a lot of rhetoric, but I think the reality is all of those things are pushed till after the election uh, with the, obviously the Democrats trying to hold on to the, to, to the Senate, uh, make some gains in the House, and the Republicans thinking uh, we have the House, uh, we have a chance to get the Senate. Uh, nobody's going to try to, <clears throat> I think, move any agenda at this point in time. And, of course, the Federal Reserve, under new leadership from Janet Yellen, uh, will continue their, their tapering phase as long as the economic developments concern. But, but again, change uh, is in the offing, if not this year, 
and certainly over the next couple of years going forward. Uh, the energy paradigm is new. Uh, we're, we're looking at, uh, at, a, at a new uh, paradigm for energy pricing, both domestically and globally. Uh, fracking and horizontal drilling are, are, are providing major shifts and so forth that will have implications, I think, not only for energy prices, but for issues like infrastructure and so forth going forward. And of course, in all of this turmoil or those black swan events that can derail uh, all of this activity in terms of moving the global economies forward. So, so again, I think we're, we're going in the right direction, but we're going very slowly with a lot of things that we've pushed off uh, that are going to have to be dealt with uh, going forward. Uh, the vulnerabilities at this point in time, I think, in the short term are obviously the Eurozone banking system uh, undergoing stress tests now uh, and how fast are they able to phase out some banks and what kind of a, of a policy are they going to put in place to protect those banks. The emerging market contagion, as I mentioned, slowing growth in China, uh, going below 7%, uh, always geopolitical risk in the Middle East. And then again, I think importantly, as I pointed out, they really do need this U.S. economy to be growing 2.5 to 3%. We, to we cannot stay in that 2 to 2.5% range if you're going to maintain global momentum uh, going forward. Uh, in the U.S., as I mentioned, I think we'll see a lot of political and policy rhetoric, uh, but not much action going forward. If you're looking at the economy in terms of growth rates, uh, in the fourth quarter we had a 3.2% uh, growth rate. Uh, this slide just shows you growth rates, and then again it talks about where does growth come from in this U.S. economy. I think what you're going to see as we get towards the end of the month, we will probably revise, uh, based on new data on the trade side, that growth rate will probably come back to about 2.5%. So I think we still have a 2.5% economy at this point in time. Uh, these first few <clears throat> months of uh, 2014 are going to be awfully important in terms of establishing uh, that this economy is on solid footing and so forth. If we continue to have this 1% you know, growth one quarter, 2% the next quarter, uh, with swings in inventories, that is not going to be positive in terms of sustaining particularly the red meat and dairy prices uh, that we're enjoying right now going forward. Uh, as they say, the, the growth rates have been very unstable quarter to quarter. Uh, the problem is that we've got a consumer that appears to be coming on a little bit stronger, but we still have no investment of any significance at this point. The business strategy for corporate America is control domestic costs to, to generate profits and invest, go, invest globally or build working capital. So we've got a lot of capital sitting on the balance sheets of these companies uh, that could be deployed. Uh, but again, I think a lot of that deployment is going to await uh, the resolution of some major policy reforms. And so when you look at this list, and, and, and I apologize to those folks who, who who may have seen this presentation a year ago, and, and they look at that and say, gee, that looks familiar. Well, the reality is we haven't really resolved any of these issues and so forth. And it's clearly now a 2015 agenda, not a 2014 agenda. And all of these issues affect the return to capital in terms of deployment of capital. So I think there's a lot of, of uh, capital sitting on the sidelines that we could have a real breakout year at some point uh, if, indeed, uh, some of these issues got resolved. Uh, this slide just reinforces that. It's corporate profits and business fixed investment. And you can see that that gap between uh, corporate profits and business fixed investment has narrowed up significantly. There's simply uh, corporate profits continue to grow, uh, but we're not redeploying that on the investment side at the same rate we were prior to 20, uh, until the meltdown in, in the financial crisis and so forth. That narrowing just says that these, these companies are holding cash uh, with a lot of potential going forward. The consumer, on the other hand, has really done a magnificent job of getting their debt load down. Uh, the debt levels have come down. Incomes are rising. Uh, we're, we're beyond the uh, tax increases that limited uh, income gains last year. Uh, so I think consumers are a little more comfortable with their income gains. Home prices are up about 13%. It's really a jobs issue now at this point. Uh, that's limiting the rebound in, in, in terms of uh, uh, consumers really beginning to aggressively spend and so forth. And I think the best indicator of that really is the uh, uh, credit card uh, Yeah, in terms of when this consumer is really comfortable, what you would see is not only spending out of current income, uh, perhaps a little reduction in savings and so forth, 
but a more aggressive pattern on, on credit card use. And you can see from this slide, we go back over the, you know, the 02 to through 08 period, the consumer really was very aggressive using credit cards in addition to uh, income gains for spending. You see that massive deleveraging from about 2008, mid 2008 till uh, through 2011. And since that time, this consumer has been very careful with regard to credit card debt. And, and I think uh, this is a barometer of uh, just how optimistic this consumer is. The surveys on, on consumer confidence bounce around a lot. I like to use this one as an indicator how confident really is this consumer. Uh, we have had a move up here recently. You can see that last blue bar moving up. That's a three-year moving average of the of credit card use. Uh, so the fourth quarter of last year, uh, this there was an aggressive use of this credit card use. I'm going to be interested to see if that's sustained in 2014. If it isn't, then that would suggest that this consumer is really not entirely comfortable with where we are, particularly on the job side. Again, the, the unemployment rate continues to move lower. Um, it's a function as much of the participation rate as the jobs growth. Uh, job growth numbers have been fairly weak the last couple of months, uh, but the participation rates come down. Uh, labor force growth has been slower and so forth, and that's allowed the uh, the uh, unemployment rate to come down. The Fed has announced a 6.5% target. Uh, we're actually getting fairly close to that target, and I think now the Fed is starting to make noises about, well, that's a target, but it's really not a target. That, uh, a six and a half percent unemployment with a very low participation rate uh, is not an indicator of where we may need to make a policy change. So even if we hit the six and a half percent, my guess is that won't be a, sig a significant change for Fed policy. The energy side, which is a not only a domestic but an international play, um, this is probably an area of optimism and so forth. If we can build the infrastructure to take advantage of these supplies, you can see it's not just the Bakken in the in the in the uh, Northern Plains and so forth. There's a lot of this in the Marcellus uh, <coughs> uh, play uh, across the country and so forth. So this is a real game changer with regard to uh, particularly issues with regard to fossil fuels and renewables uh, going forward. Uh, again, I think there, without absent the Middle East, uh, if we do indeed make some kind of arrangement with Iran with regard to nuclear policy, that's probably going to mean some Iranian oil is going to come onto the market. Uh, also would inject some stability in the Middle East. Then I think we could see a downward trend in oil prices. Uh, however, I think you have to, you always have to be worried about geopolitical risk. But I think energy is not going to be anything that's going to be spiking dramatically higher, uh, except over very short periods of time. And that's going to be positive for the market. Uh, I think going forward and also uh, going to provide some stimulus on the job side. Similarly with natural gas, I think we're seeing natural gas obviously this year, uh, a lot of issues because of weather and, and high demand needs and and, uh, and not really having uh, energy positioned properly for the kind of winter we've had. I think we'll see a slow trend upward in, in natural gas prices, but nothing dramatic because we do have large supplies. Uh, uh, going forward. So energy is not going to be the destabilizing factor in the economy that it has been in some years. Uh, fiscal and monetary policy, as I mentioned, are in transition and so forth. When you look at, uh, at the uh, fiscal side, these are November, collect November congressional elections are the dominant force at this point in time. I don't see major things moving through uh, the, the Congress at this point in time. Uh, CBO's new estimates on the budget deficit now suggest that the budget deficit may actually get to uh, about a half a trillion dollars over the next year or so. So these blue bars show you the level of the deficit. The red line is the deficit as percent of GDP. And you can see it's an improving situation uh, for the next couple of years. And then, of course, the baby boomers begin to retire. And a lot of the issues that that were driving concerns before are still there. We haven't resolved them with regard to Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, we don't know how Obamacare, how the, the Affordable Care Act is going to play out at this point in time. Uh, but clearly some issues still have to be resolved, and so that's going to create some turmoil, I think, in 2015, 2016, obviously, uh, going forward. Uh, so again, uh, we kind of kicked this problem down the road, but you can see from this slide the problem is not going to go away. Uh, we are the debt ceiling issue has been resolved through for 2014, uh, but if you look at those numbers, it implies the national debt 
uh, is really going to go up nine to ten trillion dollars over the next decade if, if some action is not taken and so forth. So uh, we have really put some things on hold, and it's important to recognize that going forward, we have less and less degrees of freedom. We're going to have to address them. It has implications for the tax code uh, and for entitlement spending and pressures on the budget that are going to return uh, in a couple of years and so forth. On the, on the monetary policy side, again, I think that the Fed has been very clear that it's going to maintain an interest rate regime that's very positive uh, in the short term. Uh, no big changes in, in, uh, in the federal funds rate contemplated at this point in time. Uh, I think you'll see the long-term rates kind of trend upward and so forth. The Fed is tapering. Uh, they are reducing their purchases uh, each month. Uh, <clears throat> as long as the economy appears to be moving forward and so forth. I think there's a combination of things here that will limit long-term interest rates. To some degree, uh, the Fed lowering its purchasing is also occurring at a time when, the, when budget deficits are declining. So there's less need to issue treasuries uh, to fund the deficit uh, in combination with the Fed being a smaller buyer. Uh, that combination means that tapering is not having quite the impact it might have been expected to have uh, if we were still trying to finance a trillion dollar deficit as opposed to finance a, a half a trillion dollar deficit. I think that the Fed role in, in uh, stabilizing interest rates on the long end is somewhat helped by uh, the fact that we're not issuing that much in the way of treasuries to fund the deficit and so forth. But I think we will see that the sometime in 2015 we're going to be talking about a different interest rate regime going forward. Uh, and I think it's instructive to look at the last couple of periods when interest rates did move. Uh, if you go back to 94 and you look in, in uh, 04, uh, you can see that, that we've had uh, you know, three to four hundred basis points over a 12 to 18 month period. So we're starting at zero this time. So I think you'd have to expect, you know, three to five hundred basis points over a 12 to 18 month period when we have the change in policy and so forth. And that that's instructive in terms of uh, looking at what's ahead of us uh, in terms of interest rate changes. Uh, the yield curve last year did move up 100 basis points in January of. 2013, that black line to January of 2014, that red line, uh, we got about 100 basis points just from the thought that, we, that, the, that the Federal Reserve might taper and so forth. So as this tapering gets moves closer and closer to zero, I think we'll continue to see the steepening of that yield curve. Uh, and then obviously, uh, once we get into uh, a real change in Fed policy at the short end of the curve, uh, we'll probably flatten that out. Of, uh, uh, bringing that short end up. So again, the interest rate regime, particularly after 2014 and so forth, is going to be changing, I think, fairly dramatically. And one of the challenges is out there is that this is not just a U.S. Federal Reserve policy. Uh, if you look at all the central banks across the globe, uh, all of them have been using the same policy in terms of adding assets to their balance sheet and so forth. To the tune of six to seven trillion dollars, that's the amount of liquidity that they've injected by uh, buying bonds or offering uh, long-term financing and so forth. Uh, these banks all have to reduce that liquidity over the next five years and so forth. Whether they can do it in a coordinated fashion, uh, that's the big issue at this point in time in terms of, uh, of, uh, of what's going to be happening. And of course, that will have implications for interest rates or for exchange rates. And again, we have seen a lot of volatility in those, in, in those exchange rates, particularly the emerging markets recently. The dollar has trended upward. Uh, for agriculture, it's important to remember that the, uh, the dollar fell by almost 40% over that period from, from 04, 02 to, to 2011. That was very supportive of, of commodity prices. Uh, I don't think we're going to see a big rebound in that, uh, but I think it's not going to be the driver that it was during that earlier period, uh, particularly the 04 through 08 period, where a weaker currency was really propelling uh, U.S. competitiveness in ag commodities and, uh, and other commodities. So again, I think that volatility is going to stay in the exchange rate markets now, either because of changes in current account deficits and capital flows uh, and realignment of central bank monetary policy. For agriculture, this, you know, this all come, rolls back into demand for commodities. Uh, and again, I think we now have an ag sector after a decade of shifts. We have an ag sector that's probably 
more export dependent than it was uh, 10 years ago, particularly the dairy and, and livestock sectors. Uh, they're now riding the global wave, uh, and many of the crop sectors are riding uh, that same global, global wave in kind of different fashions and so forth going forward. We are not accumulating a lot of reserves at this point in time on the grain side. This slide just shows you uh, that we are talking about rising grain inventories on a global basis, uh, but the stocks to use numbers are still not excessive. Uh, we would, I would have to say that we have as much pop probability of, of going to, to $6 corn as to $3 corn at this point in time, depending on uh, what that global harvest looks like for 2014 and so forth, because we're, we're not in an excessive stock position and so forth relative to global demand. Uh, if we have a shortfall someplace in the U.S., in the former Soviet Union, in South America, um, we would see these prices trending in a different direction. But right now, all we know is that we're going to plant a lot of acreage down here. Uh, and so a normal harvest would begin to put additional pressure on additional accumulation of stocks. So a lot of potential volatility is still out there uh, because I think we need a, another large harvest to really uh, begin to uh, plateau out these uh, commodity prices. The export markets continue strong. Uh, if you look at the grain sector, a lot of volatility out there because of the uncertainty with regard to, to crop developments, but you can see a pretty strong trend and obviously China drives uh, the other markets, particularly on soybeans where 66 percent of the world trade in soybeans is to China. Uh, that makes that a, a uh, almost a, a one country commodity and so forth at this point in time. Uh, so what China does with policy is going to be very important. And obviously, uh, cotton uh, trade has come off a little bit because, again, China is this beginning to slow down their rates of imports on cotton uh, because of the building surpluses and so forth. Uh, the other issue for, for agriculture, for grain agriculture, is we have a lot more competition now. One of the, one of the uh, uh, impacts or corollaries of, of feeding the uh, biofuels growth, of course, is that we opened opportunities for the rest of the world to fill in on the export markets. And, and, and what we've seen is uh, the rest of the world, the non-U.S. grain output has actually increased by 20 percent over the last five years and so forth. Harvested areas up almost 23 million acres have been brought into production uh, because of that increased demand and so forth. U.S. actually, uh, because of uh, harvest time problems and so forth, really has been pretty limited in increasing grain output. So when we come through that season and so through the this five-year period, we find ourselves with a lot more competition from Brazil, uh, former Soviet Union, and other countries who have expanded their coarse grain production uh, to fill that void that was created by a diversion of, of U.S. crop supplies uh, to feed the biofuels market. When we look at individual commodities, the wheat market, of course, uh, very much driven by wheat feeding. Uh, to, to augment the, the smaller coarse grain supplies. Uh, and it doesn't appear like we're going to see a big rebound in wheat, wheat uh, inventories this year, remembering, of course, that, that uh, uh, we didn't harvest that corn crop until, until October. So there was a lot of wheat feeding on that June to October period on a global basis. Uh, as many, many uh, users of grain got used to using wheat on the feed side, uh, that's been a big plus for the wheat market and so forth. Uh, I think that will taper a bit as we go into the 2014-15 crop. Uh, but this for this year, uh, the wheat market has held up very well. A lot of volatility in wheat production. That's been one of the catalysts for uh, optimism on the wheat side. Uh, this, the former Soviet Union has become a significant player in the export markets. When we look at this red line on production, you can see the volatility in their production. They have big swings in their production from year to year. Uh, and I think that really creates an opportunity for uh, countries like the U.S. that have fairly reliable wheat supplies uh, to hold some market share simply because of that uncertainty about what the grain availability in the Black Sea regions will really look like uh, going forward. But you can see their swings in production uh, are really anywhere from, from 75 million metric tons up to you know, 115 million metric tons. So he's talking about 30 to 40 million metric ton swings in production, which impact export availability uh, and, and really offer opportunity as a pricing in, in the wheat side on a global basis. Uh, U.S. wheat inventories will probably continue to decline. 
uh, simply because of uh, strong export markets and, as I mentioned, feed use. Um, it does not look like we're going to increase production in 2015 based on the, uh, these early wheat conditions and so forth. So um, I think the wheat markets will hold up. The big key will be what happens on the coarse grain side or corn production. If we begin to get larger supplies on the coarse grain side, that's going to have implications for, uh, for wheat feeding uh, as we go forward. The, uh, the big shifts, are, of course, are, are, are occurring in, on the corn side. Uh, this slide, I think if you look at that ethanol line, you can see that ethanol, that black line, really is plateauing out. I think you have to assume this industry is going to be about a 5 billion bushel corn in, you know, outtake. Uh, the industry is still going to be very strong. It's a viable industry. It's not going to go away. We're not going to see sharp declines in usage of corn. Um, we'll see some consolidation, I think, in the industry. But this is still going to be a vital sector for, for the corn market. Uh, and, and vital on the energy side as well. Um, but we are going to have to see some improvements in the feed side uh, to absorb these larger supplies of corn and the export side. You can see that, that corn exports declined very sharply over the last five years. We only exported about 700 million bushels of corn last year. Uh, we're assuming that we're going to, corn exports are going to go up about 120 percent. So. Uh, a lot of what we're going to see in terms of sustaining corn prices at this point does require a recovery on the export markets, uh, as well as some renewed uh, feeding on the on the grain side, on the domestic grain side going up. And again, corn prices are down about 30, 35 uh, percent, but production's up about 30 percent. So again, when we look at these, the, the total revenue, the sector is not going to be off that much. But obviously, there's going to be continued pressure on prices as we get closer to the 2014 year uh, going forward. I mentioned the competitive competitiveness in the global marketplace. This just shows you the U.S. exports and then the other major players. And what you see is that blue line of these U.S. exports, which, which had reached almost 70 million metric tons. Uh, if you go back to 07, uh, dropped down to about 20 million metric tons in, in the, at the bottom. Uh, expectation is we're going to recover some of that share, but you can see we have some new players now in Brazil, the former Soviet Union. Uh, both of those economies have shifted acres into the coarse grain side. China has been very encouraging of that shift. They would like to diversify the sources of supply of coarse grains, uh, you know, from a buyer standpoint and so forth. So you have seen them to be very aggressive, encouraging that shift of, of brown, perhaps out of wheat and other grains into feed grains. Uh, to feed their complex as well. Uh, but again, it's not going to be uh, <clears throat> kind of a slam dunk that the U.S. is going to get all that share back and so forth going forward. So it's going to be important that the global demand continues to grow because if it does stagnate, uh, then we have a lot of competitors we're going to have to be faced up with. We are expecting these corn uh, inventories to build. Uh, we'll be moving up to 1.6 billion bushels, not an excessive amount, but you can begin to see that another big harvest, add another half a billion bushels to this inventory, and suddenly you're at two billion bushels, and you will put some additional pressure on prices and so forth. So the 2014 season really is a swing year at this point in time. If you're on the livestock and dairy side, obviously uh, you're kind of rooting for a, a good harvest that would put some additional pressure on these feed prices and so forth, take some volatility out of this market. But right now I think you have to be concerned this market could go either way depending on how the 2014 crop evolves and so forth. Uh, so it'll be an important season for the, for the animal protein and dairy side. On the soybean side, we have very large inventories of soybeans on a global basis. When you look at the numbers, and, the, and again, the South American harvest now looks to be pretty solidly in place. Uh, we're talking about uh, soybean inventories in excess of 70 million uh, metric tons, record level stocks to use at a very high level and so forth. Uh, but these prices have held up extremely well going forward. These inventories are being held by the major exporters. So when you look at who's got these inventories, it's really not being held by the buyers. It's really being held by the major exporters and so forth. And so they're carrying the inventory. Uh, <clears throat> the prices are being supported by the reality that the Chinese are still aggressive buyers of soybeans. Uh, they have uh, had a fourfold increase in their imports of soybeans over the last decade. Uh, they have not attempted to increase their production at all. 
Uh, the domestic use continues to rise sharply. It's a value-added strategy for them. Uh, the concern is that they should slow down a little bit uh, with this big overhang in the market already. Uh, you can have a big adjustment in prices. So it's very important for the Chinese not only to maintain but to continue to increase uh, their importation of, of soybeans. So far, there's no indication that, that they are slowing down. Uh, but again, I think this is one of the dangers of this market in terms of potential downside risk. Uh, we're not going to gain much in inventory this year. Uh, Chinese have been very aggressive buyers. We may see some cancellation where we may roll some buys into next year if the South American crop can come out of the uh, uh, ports in, the, in a uh, timely fashion, then I think we'll probably see some some uh, cancellations or moves of, of, uh, of uh, purchases of uh, soybeans. Uh, but again, the big key that continues to be China and so forth, and I think as we look forward, uh, we're probably going to see some additional acreage come into production, which will begin to add to inventory. So when you look at the price scenario out there, you look at these prices, uh, they have come off fairly significantly, particularly on the, the, the corn and, and, and soybean complex and so forth uh, for the 23-14 crop. Uh, and when you look out at 2014, 15, obviously we're we're a long ways away in terms of how much acreage we're going to plant, uh, what the demand per picture is going to be look like. Look like at this point, with more soybean acres, uh, continued large planting on the corn side, uh, it seems to me price pressures are going to stay there on the uh, on the grains and oil seeds complex. A little less so in the wheat side because we know already that uh, uh, we're not going to be able to, to push wheat production U.S. wide very much, so I think that's going to leave that complex pretty stable. And you can see the other commodities, some will be under more pressure than others depending on how these acreage shifts occur. Uh, and right now the expectation is we'll probably cut it, corn acres, maybe 3 million acres, see 4 or 5 million more acres of soybeans. That's what sets up that scenario, but again, we have a long ways to go before this all plays out. But it's pretty strategic for the animal protein and dairy side to take some of that volatility out of the feed price side uh, while they're enjoying pretty good margins on the uh, uh, on the meat side. Uh, we do have a five-year farm bill in, in, that has been passed from a legislative standpoint. It's been signed. Uh, we are going to phase out the direct payments. We're moving to more insurance type, revenue insurance type programs. We have a new dairy program uh, with no supply management to, to speak of. Uh, but the devil's in the details and we still have to develop all the regulatory language and so forth. So I think a lot of people are scratching their heads at this point in time in terms of, well, what is this going to look like? It's going to be highly variable even by county for some commodities. Uh, so I think to some degree we have to kind of wait till we see some of this language and how it's going to be implemented going forward. And again, remembering that you know we'll revisit this farm bill. Any, any attempt to redo or begin to address deficits again will bring us back to a debate about uh, spending in the farm bill as we go forward. Uh, with regard to the animal protein and dairy side, again, I think the big driver on the animal protein side continues to be uh, the, uh, the cattle inventory, lowest since 1951. Not likely that we're going to see any buildup in the cattle inventory probably until uh, January of 2016 and so forth. So maybe some building of, of inventory in 2015, uh, but this is going to keep beef supplies very limited going to really open opportunities for all the other animal protein side uh, in terms of pricing and market share. Uh, we have not seen a significant increase in, in uh, meat production in this country uh, for three years now, and, and there's no reason to believe as we go forward uh, until we get into 2015 that you're going to see significant supplies of meat in the meat case. That's going to be supportive of prices. If this consumer continues on its current pattern and so forth, it will continue to support the kind of prices we're talking about, the kind of margins. And so a lot of rebuilding of balance sheets is occurring. Uh, after a, a year or so of real stress in these balance sheets, we're beginning to see recovery. Uh, and the question will be, how quickly will the pork and broiler industry expand uh, to take advantage of this uh, vacuum created by the beef side? Uh, the export markets continue strong for, for, for pork and broilers. Uh, the, the dominating factor that's coming out of all of this, of course, is greater export dependency. Uh, boilers at 20 percent, uh, pork now exporting 22 percent, and on the skim basis, on the dairy side, we're up to about 16 percent. So uh, this, this export dependency theme is going to continue to play out and so forth. 
uh, it will be interesting, particularly as we see some of these emerging markets have some problems, uh, whether we can uh, continue to grow the market. It's not good enough just to hold the market at this point in time. We have to continue to grow it if domestic production in those sectors are going to continue to increase. On the dairy side, we continue to move milk production higher. Uh, even during the, the uh, financial stress period, uh, we continue to move milk production a little bit higher, but we have had a lot of realignments of production in terms of regional shifts and so forth. Uh, but the dairy industry at this point in time, uh, all indicators are going forward. Uh, you know, a very positive year, a lot of encouragement for expanded production and so forth. The export market obviously has been a big key, and you can see from this slide the dramatic increases in exports, particularly this year, last year, going into 2014, uh, fairly dramatic increases up as we take advantage of, of opportunities presented by problems in, in, uh, in uh, New Zealand and other regions and, and growing demand in China and so forth. But again, uh, this is an export-dependent uh, industry now, and the dynamics in the industry change in terms of volatility. So I think when you begin to accept the greater export uh, dependency, you have to accept the volatility that goes with that. But right now, there's a lot of optimism in terms of, uh, of going forward. We're still talking about record cattle prices. Hog prices continue to be very strong. The broiler side uh, is probably moving towards some kind of record numbers, depending on how rapidly they expand their production. And certainly for dairy, we're talking about uh, continued price improvement. Uh, but again, all of these sectors have a much more uh, export dependency now than they've had before. Uh, and these markets can change pretty quickly. And that's kind of a new scenario for those industries to deal with. Uh, the feed side, that volatility seems to be a little bit behind us at this point in time. But certainly that export volatility is going to stay with us uh, in terms of going forward. So when you look at the sector as a whole, what you see is these crop prices are coming down fairly dramatically from their peaks. We're seeing kind of steady upward movement in the livestock and, and dairy side, closing that gap, getting better balance between the two. But the cost pressures, you'll notice that those prices paid, uh, that green line is not coming down quite as fast as the crop side. So I think what we're going to begin to see is a realignment here in terms of returns uh, with the animal protein and dairy side probably enjoying a better margin they've seen for some time uh, with the crop side beginning to show some squeeze and so forth. I think you can see that in, in some recent numbers on, on expectations of our income for 2014. The USDA has projected that uh, net cash income for 2014 is probably going to be about $100 billion and so forth. That would be you know, some $30 billion below last year and so forth. And you can see that uh, significant realignment is probably underway if this occurs. If we, if we get that big 2014 crop that, that is potentially there, uh, we could see some further deterioration. Now, some of this, of course, is uh, reflective of the fact that producers do have some grain inventory as well. This is just the cash flow side. I think you're going to begin to see some pressures we haven't seen for three or four years and so forth uh, as we begin to realign to these new market realities going forward. Uh, similarly, on the balance sheet of agriculture, when you look at this balance sheet of assets and debt, this sector is in a very strong position to kind of absorb this kind of transition in terms of cash flow and so forth. So uh, I think you know, the, the sector is better prepared to deal with this than they were perhaps in the early 1980s when we had a similar collapse in prices and so forth. And they've not leveraged up and so forth, but that does not mean on individual situations uh, that you're not going to see some stress and so forth. Uh, land values have moved up about 40% over the last uh, uh, five years, six years or so. Uh, debt levels have, have also begun to move up. But again, still a pretty strong balance sheet in the aggregate uh, for agriculture. Land values, and I think you may have seen today's Wall Street Journal, that was a front page article about you know, land auction that, that, that didn't materialize, that there wasn't, uh, wasn't a bid that matched the, uh, uh, the minimum and so forth. So we are going to begin to see some adjustments in land values relative to these cash flows and so forth. But it will be very uneven across the country because the gains in land values in different regions have been very different. Uh, in the southeast, land values actually fell from 2008 to 2013. Uh, if you go through the heartland of the country, obviously, that's where all the big gains in, in, in land values have been, particularly in the northern plains where you have an energy play uh, from the 
obviously the shale play up there as well as the agricultural play, uh, they may not suffer as much simply because of the energy sector. But again, I think we're going to see adjustments in land values, particularly as we start getting into a higher interest rate regime. Uh, we're going to be seeing adjustments across agriculture. So again, I think the, the news is ag still is a very strong sector in the economy. Uh, with a transition period kind of underway and so forth, and, and the, the 2014 harvest may change the timing of that and so forth, uh, but I think if we stand, go back to kind of trend yields and, and look at the expansion we've had in the area, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, some further adjustments, particularly on the balance sheet side going forward, uh, and again, uh, continuing to have to build the export volatility uh, that uh, is going to be with us, I think, uh, for the foreseeable future for agriculture. Let me stop here and, and see if we have uh, uh, any questions at this point in time. Gary, thanks so much for uh, a uh, very uh, uh, comprehensive trip around the uh, U.S. agriculture and uh, global impacts. That's uh, a lot, of, lot of food for thought there, and uh, really appreciate the uh, kind of the total package there that you've shared with us over the last uh, uh, 45 minutes or so. We're uh, we've got uh, limited time here, so I'm going to give you a couple questions and ask you for relatively brief answers uh, so that we can stay on time, Terry. Uh, first okay. question: uh, Your slide on unemployment rate. A lot of discussion here over the last several months as the reports have come out. You know, is how meaningful that term is, uh, or that particular uh, measure is at this point. Uh, uh, a lot of people dropped out of the labor force or are uh, underemployed. Uh, is that the right, even the right number for the Fed to be watching anymore? Or is it coming kind of a, you know, do we need a new metric to uh, look at uh, kind of the health of employment in this country? I, I think I think clearly there's there's there, there's some major structural things behind all these numbers. So I think the answer the Fed has already kind of given you the answer to that. Uh, they're not going to be stuck to a rigid number and so forth. They're going to look at the totality of it in terms of you know how much of this is uh, due to uh, uh, kind of short-term participation drops and how much is due to actual job growth. I suspect the job growth number is probably going to be more important than the level of unemployment as we go forward. Um, and I think we, we do know that a lot of this could be retirement. Uh, people's 401ks have recovered and so forth, and so you're going to have a lot of people dropping out of the labor force. Uh, but the broader measure of unemployment that includes those people getting part-time jobs and looking for full-time jobs, you know, that number is closer to 10% or so. so I think the Fed's going to be very careful about using any single indicator uh, as a uh, economic performance gauge uh, going forward. And obviously, uh, because inflation is fairly benign, uh, the unemployment rate has got most of the focus and so forth. But I think they'll return to kind of a broader view of the economy. Next question, Terry. Uh, how soon do you see markets adjusting interest rates in anticipation of the Fed? making the Fed funds rate adjusting back to a more normal range? Well, I mean, I, I think at this point the markets can indicate, you know, late, you know, mid to late 2015 being the kind of the, the scenario that plays out and so forth. But obviously all of these things that we've talked about uh, are, are going to come into play in terms of, you know, this economy is going to have to be very solid footing. This Fed is not going to want to be the one that, that uh, spikes interest rates and stops a, a housing recovery and so forth. So uh, again, uh, my expectation is probably late 2015 at this point, assuming that housing starts are now over uh, a million units and so forth. If the economy is growing, uh, you know, three percent at that point in time, I think that's an indicator uh, that the Fed's probably going to shift policy. Uh, but because I think they know that it's going to be a fairly aggressive change after after nearly a decade of, of zero or near zero interest rates, they know when they change policy, it's going to have some psychological impacts and so forth. So I, I, my guess is, you know, late 2015, if the economy's you know showing some three percent growth rates, you're going to see a Fed policy transition, uh, and I think you'll probably see the long rates move a little bit before that in anticipation of 
uh, policy change and so forth. So there's a lot of psychology that first thing goes into the long end of the market as we begin to go forward. Uh, and again, uh, historically, the Fed's late to this. So I mean, one has to expect you know late 2015 and 2016 would be my best guess. Last question, Terry. Uh, so many of your charts, uh, China is a uh, prime player, obviously. Uh, in terms of, you know, the the last decade or a little bit more has been uh, clearly uh, an era of tremendous growth for that economy. Uh, a few years ago, uh, folks used to forecast when they would surpass the United States in terms of overall size. Um, do you see a, a continued robust uh, growth rate for the Chinese economy overall, or do you see them slowing down as some of their uh, structural issues and, and political uh, uh, pressures uh, come to bear here in the coming years? Well, I, I think they've already acknowledged that, that uh, you know their new 10-year uh, plan is, is focused around about 7.5% growth. They've made a big statement about quality of growth as well as as opposed to the rate of growth. And I think that tells you that even they realistically know that they have major environmental issues, they have major uh, uh, demographic issues are going to have to be dealt with. Uh, so my guess is 7% growth is a pretty good number for them. Uh, obviously, you have to be very careful interpreting their numbers. Uh, growth will be what they say it is what, what they want it to be and so forth. But there's a lot of people who believe their growth rate Right now, maybe closer to six percent and seven percent, and there are some people talking about, you know, if they may have a little hiccup, we may be talking about three or four percent growth. So, so I think it's highly variable, but certainly not of the growth rates are not going to match the past decade. And again, the other thing to remember, of course, is that that economic growth with regard to food commodities uh, may be less of an important issue because, again, political stability requires you know, adequate food, food supplies and so forth. So there will be an effort to maintain that food supply chain even in light of slower economic growth, but it certainly will have an impact on the overall markets because a lot of the emerging markets drive off of China, uh, and that's where you may see more of the secondary effect as opposed to just in China. Terry, I'm going to wrap it there. Uh, again, thank you so much for uh, very uh, clear, lots of good graphs, uh, lots of good information for us to think about as we uh, plan for our businesses this year, uh, and and uh, well well presented. So uh, thanks for that. We look forward to thank having you. you back in future time. Thank you. With that, I'm going to shift over and uh, introduce Monty Lake, our uh, next speaker. Again, uh, back for uh, a repeat performance. We've had Monty with us uh, a number of times on webinars, and uh, our relationship with him goes back uh, uh, at least 10 years and probably more like 15. Uh, Farm Credit East and its predecessor organizations have been uh, very active in, in seeking uh, immigration reform, a workable guest worker program uh, for agriculture, and so we, we've we known Monty Lake through that uh, effort for a long time. Uh, he's been a great leader uh, in that effort and uh, certainly is highly knowledgeable in the dynamics of this issue uh, as well as labor law in general. And so I want to introduce uh, Monty Lake. Uh, from uh, his law firm in Washington, D.C., and uh, ask him to give us an ag labor update. Monty, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I've been asked to uh, kind of give you an overview of what's been going on more of the enforcement side uh, of our laws in, with regard to immigration and labor. And uh, just as a way of introduction, um, as has been indicated, we have, as an industry, sought to come up with a better guest worker program and, uh, and try to come up with um, uh, a lot improved system so that you can access labor in a relatively easy manner at a competitive cost with your uh, competitors uh, overseas. Uh, we passed a bill in the Senate that's probably the best agricultural labor bill we've had that deals with both the undocumented workers 
as well as the new Gushwicker program that's a lot more streamlined and easier and affordable to use than the current H-2A program. Uh, the House has reported out of the Judiciary Committee uh, a guestworker program and a, a kind of a quasi-legalization program that takes the undocumented workers into uh, a legal status. Uh, right now, the House is stalled. Uh, it seems to be week to week uh, as to whether they're going to move or not. Uh, last week, at the Republican retreat, it looked like they were. Uh, shortly, a few days later, over the weekend, it looks like things are stalled. So. What we have to deal with, and what I'm going to talk about, is what's going on now that has motivated uh, the need for reform for a workable system. Uh, in terms of the labor supply nationwide in the past year, there's been shortages from the West Coast to the, the Midwest, all, all parts of the country. Um, and coupled with that, we've seen an unprecedented amount of ICE enforcement. Uh, that's the Immigration Customs Enforcement Agency of the Department of Homeland Security who conducts worksite audits. If you haven't had an audit, very simply put, uh, what involves is involved is that uh, an ICE official will contact you, will show up, wants to collect all of your I-9 forms, the forms you fill out when you hire workers to document that they're legally authorized to work, ask for documents going back typically two to three years, uh, depart, and then several weeks later you will receive a letter indicating uh, that certain of your workers uh, basically are not authorized to work. It's called a letter. A letter is called a notice of uh, suspect documents. Uh, under the Bush administration, going back to before fiscal year 2008, we saw very few audits. We saw high-profile raids. Uh, the Obama administration has focused on raids. You can look at the numbers I put out here on this slide, and you can see a substantial increase in audits. And while 3,000 seems uh, small, they they really increased substantially. They've gone after larger uh, operations typically, although there have been some small ones. They've hit a lot of dairy. Uh, they've hit uh, vegetable, fruit, nursery, really the whole range of agricultural production. And the fines are basically fines for technical violations of filling out the I-9 form. You can see uh, the substantial increase. And these range from $110 to $1,100 per violation. That's for each I-9 form. And so uh, what you need to understand here is that the last several years, uh, there's been a real uh, increase in the fine levels. Uh, there's a lot of uh, discretion on the part of the Immigration Customs Enforcement on these fines. Um, we have a small client up in Minnesota who had vegetable a grower who basically uh, received $100,000 with a fine for a small number of violations, which would be crippling to their operation. They're in the process of negotiating them down and getting a payment plan. Uh, we've had large uh, employers in the West who employ numerous uh, workers who have been hit with fines upwards of uh, uh, several million dollars uh, because of volume. Uh, for some technical violations. And again, uh, again, you can try to get these down. They do have discretion if you are audited and are fortunate enough to get a demand for these penalties. Uh, by all means, negotiate with them because they do have discretion. Um, the practical advice is that it's always been, but it is uh, incredibly important, is when you have slow times, make sure that your staff, you or whoever conducts your uh, I-9 audits, looks at your forms. Are they being completed completely? Uh, are there boxes that are not filled in? Uh, you know, all of these types of technical things range from $110 to $1,100 each, each one. Uh, is your staff responsible for this being updated and current on what's going on? You can go to uh, the website at ICE. Uh, they basically have a handbook. They have pretty good instructions on what they're looking for. So again, these are the minor technical things that when they show up unannounced or with very, you know, three days of notice uh, that really can take their toll in terms of fines. Are you documenting too much? There's another part of the immigration law that says if you're asking for too many documents from workers, that could basically result in a discrimination charge. So if, for example, in the section for an A document, which is a document such as an, uh, an alien card that's both an identity and an authorization document, but you also put in B and C, the same document, the Social Security card and driver's license. You're over-documenting, that can lead to the fines. 
there's a lot of myths in this business, and, and for our H-2A employers, those of you who are involved in that program, um, we had a client again in Arizona who was used to E-Verify, um, had a large H-2A workforce, and basically listed the I-94, which is the entry document from ICE, uh, but didn't put the passport number, even though it was unclear in the I-9 form. Uh, they were hit with a you know, fine of several hundred thousand dollars, even though they were actually in E-Verify and had documentation that the workers were legal. Uh, again, uh, overkill, a technical a problem. In fact, there was so much confusion that they even revised the form. We now explicitly ask for passport numbers. So again, these are the types of little myths that can add up. If you're auditing your records, you're familiarizing yourself with the latest form, with the later, latest handbook for employers, you're going to avoid a lot of these problems. Uh, basically, uh, again, if they ask for a specific set of records, you've got to give them all the records. If you end up not giving them all the records, they can get you compliance with those that you didn't provide. Um, finally, when you get your notice of suspect documents um, or for clients, you can request a hearing within 30 days of receiving a letter. It's an administrative law proceeding. Uh, you may want to seek counsel if you're going to do that, and if the demand is high, the fines are high, there may be no alternative other than to try to get in front of the administrative law judge and, and get mitigation of the high uh, damage demand. The, let me just talk about the notice of suspect documents. For our clients and growers who have these audits, typically you can have a letter that indicates that anywhere from 70, 80 to 90 percent of your workforce uh, does have documents that the government finds that are not legitimate. And that's devastating. We've had those involved in food and vegetable production uh, get those letters and the keep of harvest. We've had packing houses getting them uh, that are crippling. And you've got 10 days to basically respond. That's the typical period they'll give you. Um, once you get those letters, you have to act. And you have to sit down. We recommend with each employee on the list privately, not as a group, and explain to them what's happened, that they are on a government uh, document that says after review of the government database that they're not authorized to work. And so uh, unless they can come up with new documentation that you can show to the government, you're going to have to let those people go. And I can tell you uh, that's a very, very traumatic time for both the employer, who often is basically letting go supervisors and managers who've been with them for many, many years who are critical key employees in their workforce. Uh, but again, you have to comply. If you don't, then you're going to be facing uh, more serious charges of, of employing undocumented workers, not just paperwork violations of the I-9 form. You can try to get them to negotiate and give you some flexibility in terms of your season. Again, we have a small grower who got hit during the, the end of harvest time and, and we were able to negotiate a few extra weeks so that they could get through it and, uh, without having to go out of business. So again, you have to be aggressive uh, when you put in these situations. But this has been ongoing. There's been a lot of complaints by members of Congress about this. Uh, priority that they should be going after criminal aliens, economic migrants who are trying to support their families and who are critical to our economy. There's some indication, although nothing that's formally been announced, with some meetings we've had uh, with folks in the position to make these types of decisions, that they may be shifting away from these audits and eliminating the harsh quotas that they have had over the past several years that each of the district directors have had to, to basically satisfy to maybe more of a criminal alien focus. But nothing formal has been announced yet. We are hopeful that will happen. Let's talk about the current H-2A uh, program issues. Um, probably 5% or so of our seasonal workforce is in this program, which allows admissions for up to 10 months for an employer. It's a minor part of our workforce because it is such a difficult program to use. Um, and I'm going to hit some of the issues that we have been seeing in the past year or so. They tend to change from year to year. Needless to say, there has been more aggressive enforcement by the Department of Labor against HUA employers in the past several years than we've ever seen. It's a very complex program. It's easy to make mistakes or get confused. And these can result in very, very serious fines and potentially debarment from the program. So let's hit a couple of the key issues. Employee misclassification. We see this a lot in the uh, labor-intensive agriculture where 
The question is whether the workers engage in agriculture, which is H2A, or non-agriculture, which is H2B. Uh, you have typically fruit and vegetable operations where clearly the production and harvest activities are H2A. They, they meet the definitions of the Labor Standards Act and the IRS code. Um, but sometimes those workers, you know, there may be a packing operation. And uh, there may be a, a packing uh, of not only the grower's crop, but of neighbor's crop. Uh, so if it becomes an issue of in the packing part of the business, 50% so or more is for uh, other growers, not the grower has the packing operation, then you're going to lose your agricultural status, at least for purposes of potentially both the H2A program, and you're going to lose your agricultural overtime. So this is a serious, serious problem. A lot of growers um, basically make the judgment, well, I'm going to bring in two sets of workers, H uh, H2A for my field, H2B for the packing, because I may not know whether I'm going to be packing 50% or more uh, of other growers' products, but I don't want to get hit with misclassification and end up with a huge overtime liability if they turn out to be each to be workers because I am packing over 50%. These are tough calls to make, uh, you know, and basically err on the side of, of basically having correct classifications because if you have H2A workers in the packing house and they're really treated as non-ag workers for those purposes, and you're not paying them overtime, they're working a lot of hours, uh, you're going to have a big bill. Uh, this Department of Labor has also been very aggressive in basically uh, charging growers and farmers with uh, fraudulent misrepresentation. If you misrepresent that you're using H2A workers when they turn out to be H2B, or you're interchanging them uh, in the operation. And again, this is something we've seen uh, recently uh, and it's a serious, serious problem. So these are very, very important distinctions to make. You need to be familiar with that line is between ag and non-ag. Let's shift to the next issue, corresponding employment. If you have an H-2A job, that's what the job you describe in your job order uh, when you're seeking workers and doing your U.S. recruitment. Uh, any U.S. worker who's in that job as described in the job order is in corresponding employment. That means they have to get the same wages and the same terms and conditions and benefit, including free housing and uh, worksite transportation to the job and back. Failure to do that is going to end up with a big, big back wage liability. And this has been a very contentious issue where we've had a number of clients in New York State and, and in the East that have been hit hard by the wage and hour division on this. And let me just give you an extreme example that shows you how unfair and arbitrary this can be. Uh, the job order described every activity involved in the, in the production of apples and the harvesting of apples, and they used the word pack in that job order. Independently of the production side of apples, there was a commercial packing shed. And that grower basically, because he packed for other growers, had H2B workers in there, or you know, domestic workers, and he paid them as if they were not agriculture, he paid them overtime very distinct division, but because the job order for H2A used the word pack, it treated that as a commercial packing operation and tried to bring all of the domestic workers in the packing house into the H2A uh, job classification where they would have to pay very be paid very elevated adverse effect wages, uh, which would be crippling to the grower. Again, we think the department was wrong, we think that was arbitrary, the grower contested it. Um, but again, they're taking a very broad liberal interpretation of these provisions. So you need to be very, very familiar with these corresponding employment provisions. Uh, another issue that has uh, arisen this past year, and, and these are issues that have come out of nowhere, uh, were not problems before, but because of the aggressive uh, enforcement and technical requirements imposed by this administration, we're seeing a lot of new issues. The area intended employment is what you describe in your job order for the H2A workers, where they're going to be working. And it's been pretty clear cut. It's going to be standard uh, statistical areas and, and agricultural rural areas. These can be very broad. Um, and in many areas like eastern Washington state, which is huge geographically, it's considered one area of intended employment. Uh, in Florida, the same thing for Florida citrus. They have a huge areas. Uh, that go north and south, south of the state for large citrus production, considered one area of 
tenant employment. All of a sudden, the Department of Labor is breaking up uh, traditional areas into multiple areas of intended employment, which means multiple job orders, multiple paperwork burdens, multiple application costs, and basically you have to have housing in each of these areas. Uh, it defies uh, the practical operation of uh, these workforces. Uh, housing often becomes unavailable. So they've arbitrarily imposed a 60-mile rule, anything outside of 60 miles from where uh, basically the activities are occurring is outside the area of employment, and you then have to file additional applications for those areas. It's arbitrary. They use Google Maps. It's very imprecise. And essentially, uh, what we have, con we have concluded is that the department is trying to force uh, growers in these types of situations into joint employer associations. Because under the regulations, if you're a joint employer association, you're not constrained by this limited area of intended employment. You can work in multiple areas if you are growers in the association. The problem with the joint employer association, and there's very few of them in the United States using the H-2A program, is that the joint employer liability, the sin of one grower can be basically transferred over to the other growers in the association. And the association itself is subject to liability for the sins of its members. So again, there's been real reluctance to use this. So this is in the, in the process of being challenged and litigated in certain areas because it's been extremely disruptive. So these are some of the new issues we're seeing every year for the past several. We've seen a new set of issues, all of which are costly and crippling for employers trying to make this program work. The H-2A employer who also uh, receives audit letters from the Office of Foreign Labor Certification. And many of you, if you're in the program, have typically received these letters. They request additional documentation from you. It can be while you're still in the middle of using the program. It could be for what you did the prior year. Um, there's a wide range of, uh, of time frames which in these letters, in which these letters are sent. And again, you have to respond. Uh, they're kind of a burden. And uh, you'll be waiting anxiously for a number of weeks or months to see the results. And what we see typically is a letter will be sent back to the grower, the farmer, indicating that, well, we're not going to take any action against you now, but you did have a violation of A, B, or C. And so a lot of growers just take that and put it in the file and say, well, I dodged the bullet. They're not going to go after me. Our advice is to basically challenge a finding if they say that you violated something. You, you typically, when there is an alleged violation, when the wage and hour division uh, comes in and audits you, you have a right to contest it. You have a right to a hearing. There's no such process on these letter, letter audits. So we recommend that you send a letter back to them and say, we challenge the fact that we violated anything. So as a matter of record, uh, you have something in your file, they have something in their file that you're not accepting their finding of a violation, which is arbitrary. And how this comes back and bites you is if you don't, as we see, they'll come back later after another audit in the next year and basically try to increase the penalties against you because uh, of this prior finding in their letter audit. And uh, you should be in a position to say, wait a minute, we disagree. So um, in any event, uh, you need the type, that type of documentation. Let's talk about uh, wage and hour investigations. Uh, these are uh, have been ongoing in an unprecedented amount uh, over the past couple of years. So there's been a large number of new hires by the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division. And uh, basically, um, they're very aggressive. And some of the issues are issues we see recurring. Uh, and we're just spotting a couple of them here so you'll be aware of it. Again, the agricultural uh, exemption from overtime, which we talked about in the classification a few minutes ago, persists persist as, a, as a real problem. And we are trying to uh, you know, provide some basic tips here. Again, it goes back to are you uh, producing all your own product? Are you producing the product? Uh, are you handling the product of others? We see this a lot in, uh, in nurseries. We see it in a lot of types of businesses where there's either a, uh, a packing house, whether there's, uh, you know, you, you can't fill the demands of your customers and you need to 
uh, basically uh, fill it in. And once you start, your workers start handling the product of another grower, uh, they're losing that exemption. So are you packing for others? How much? Uh, it has lots of effects, and you need to monitor it. One of the practical things we advise is that if you are bringing in product from others and you have to do that to survive, then that you basically have designated employees handling the product of others in a particular work week. Because it's only the employees who are touching the product of others that are going to lose the exemption. So you can limit your exposure if you have a system where you can you know, track it administratively and have record keeping to mitigate it. Because it's only those who touch uh, the other product. Another issue that we've seen um, arise a, a lot in the past uh, year or two, and uh, we just litigated a case in Maryland involving this issue and the grower prevailed, is uh, the whole question when you have to pay overtime for over 40 hours in a week if you are not exempt, um, is it calculation based on a day-to-day -day, uh, amount of hours worked or is it for the entire work week? And it's clearly the entire work week. It's not the person worked 12 hours in one day. If it averaged out over the work week to be you know, 40 hours or less, then you don't have an exposure. But uh, we've had the Department of Labor and plaintiff's lawyers come in and basically look at it on a day-to-day -day basis of whether you work more than eight hours a day. And that's clearly not the way the, the law works. But we've seen that issue arise um, in, the, in the past uh, year or so. And again, you just need to be aware of that. Um, let's talk about transportation reimbursement. In the H-2A program, uh, the regulations are clear. If uh, You have to reimburse a foreign worker coming from a foreign country after they complete 50% of the H-2A contract, and not before that time. And if they complete the entire contract, then you pay for their return transportation. That's no clear cut. It's never been a problem. In the past um, in several years, uh, the Department of Labor plaintiffs lawyers are basically saying, no, this is a really fair labor standards wage and hour issue. Uh, if the workers pay their own transportation from the foreign country to the farm uh, and the cost of that transportation brings the first week's wages below the minimum wage, in other words, if it's $400 in transportation and subsistence cost to get to the farm from Mexico, um, and you look at their wages that first week and you deduct the $400 and it works out to be less than the minimum wage for that first week, uh, then you have a violation. And you have to make sure that they're whole after the first week, not the 50% of the contract period. Uh, there's been aggressive litigation in New York State on this. Uh, most of the federal district courts have basically sided with the plaintiff's lawyers and the Department of Labor and said, yes, that's the way it is, even though the regulations say after 50%. Uh, so the law in this area is very muddled. Uh, there's a decision out of Florida, the Ariaga decision, uh, that basically endorsed this view of first week's liability. Then in the Cater case in New Orleans, uh, that Fifth Circuit went the other way and said, no, that's not true. That's not the way the law works. And most recently, uh, Perry Farms decision uh, out of Nevada in the West Coast, uh, the Ninth Circuit just reversed the district court to sided with the grower and, and found, along with the area, of course, that no, you have to pay this, uh, these uh, wages within the first week. So there's a confusion and dependent upon where you're located, um, you know, the law's going to be different. So the Perry Farms uh, has bit the bullet and they're seeking a review before the United States Supreme Court. It was filed this past week um, to basically, uh, because there's a conflict, throughout the United States that the Supreme Court to come down with the decision. So uh, the National Council of Agricultural Employers, which has been active uh, on all of these major issues, is filing a friend of the court brief in support of Perry Farms to basically uh, have the current H-2A regulations, which state that you only have to reimburse up to 50 percent uh, of the H-2A contract to be the law. And so that is a very, very hot issue, very current issue. What people don't understand, but the real agenda here with the Department of Labor and with plaintiff's lawyers, is to treat this transportation reimbursement issue the same with U.S. migrant workers as with H-2A workers. So if you have migrant workers that come up the East Coast to uh, the Northeast, 
and we had a grower in Delaware who had this problem, was sued in federal court by Mexican workers, excuse me, U.S. Latino workers coming from Texas up to the East Coast uh, who wanted their transportation reimbursed from the, the travel costs from Texas to Delaware, as well as their meals. And talk about a nightmare. Uh, that, that's the ultimate extension. And frankly, from a logical standpoint, because you're dealing with the federal wage and hour law, that's the theory under which this challenge is brought, that there should be no distinction from remote traveling U.S. migrant workers and H-2A foreign workers. So that's kind of the, the real concern here and why the business community is going to be filing a um, friend of the court piece in support of Perry Farms' a cert petition for the U.S. Supreme Court. So again, keep your eye on that one. I know I'm uh, running out of time here, so let me just bring it to a conclusion, and then uh, we'll answer whatever questions time permits. Uh, ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement, Oversight Enforcement uh, investigations have been at an all-time high, aggressive. Uh, basically, check your I-9 forms, make sure they're complete, make sure that they're not over-documented, make sure your staff understands how to do it right, go online, check the handbook for employers you know, on the website, and it's very easy to read, and, and you make sure you have the current latest I-9 forms. They've changed them several times in the past several years. If you're in the H-2A program or H-2B program, be sure you understand them. They're complex. They're litigation magnets. Uh, they're not favored by the Department of Labor, and they're not favored by plaintiff's lawyers. So again, you go in at your own risk. You may have no choice but to use those programs. Make sure you understand the many gotchas that are required uh, and are you know, basically going to be problems for you if you're not doing it right. Uh, this is the bottom line in any type of employment law seminar, and it is always the same. You've got to place a priority on being proactive. You've got to monitor your own practices regularly, particularly if you have staff turnover. Don't assume that even though the staff may have a background in human resources that they are doing it right. And so basically, you know, it's up to you. Try to have this audit done during slow periods of the year so that when you get the unexpected audit, and if you're an H2A, you certainly can expect them, uh, that you are ready and you're going to come through with flying colors. And with that, I'm going to uh, take whatever questions there are out there. Monty, thank you for a great job. Uh, you know, tough topic. Um, it's very technical. Uh, none of us like to hear uh, this stuff. It's uh, uh, a lot of trap for the unwary and obviously a very emotional issue, and you did a great job of uh, taking us through it. Um, first question, um, in a number of uh, points, you said, uh, you know, basically don't just take the uh, initial field ruling, uh, you know, uh, as, a, as a given, uh, appeal it. Uh, as you uh, observe these cases going to the administrative law judges or whoever is uh, determining them, uh, are they generally sympathetic to small business owners or are they uh, more likely to I uh, want to throw the book as well and, and make life more difficult. Good question. Um, we have appealed a number of cases, uh, particularly with H-2A employers, since this administration took over. Uh, I would say uh, we win 90% of them. If they go to complete hearing, what often happens, you are set for a hearing. And at the last minute, the Department of Labor lawyers will basically surrender, put the white flag up, because their clients are the Wage and Hour Division or the Office of Foreign Labor Certification. Lawyers are the ones that have to basically try to justify legally what the agencies that they support as lawyers have basically uh, put upon them. And in many, many cases are just not legally supportable. So the point is, don't be afraid to challenge them. Um, they are pushing the envelope on a lot of these issues that I talked about. And so, you know, no one wants to hire a lawyer. Uh, talk to your association, talk to whoever you look for guidance in this. But, um, you know, if you, if you just lay down and take it, they're just going to, you know, use that as momentum to go after more growers and, and tell your neighbor, well, Joe Blow down the street basically capitulated on this. So on the ICE audits, with Immigration Customs Enforcement, uh, we've basically found that 
they're more flexible and more willing to work with growers and farmers to resolve issues, uh, at least in terms of technical I-9 violations. If you've got workers who are unauthorized, they don't have any discretion, even though they are sympathetic, uh, that you may be losing your workforce and therefore uh, go into economic uh, you know, hardship, uh, that they basically say, look, we're just doing our jobs. So but we found ICE more willing to uh, negotiate into a reasonable settlement compliance uh, mode with the foreigners. Next question. Uh, uh, you know, you've, you've made a very strong case for, uh, you know, double checking, triple checking, making sure that your uh, required documentation is in order. Uh, and, you know, if you're a larger business like Farm Credit East, you have an internal audit department that, uh, you know, checks over stuff like that. Uh, very few farm employers would, would have an internal audit or even somebody with that title uh, in their name. Are there checklists or, you know, a protocol for how you could, uh, you know, the owner or some other uh, management person within the business could do kind of a uh, self-audit of their own uh, labor documentation records to, you know, make sure that uh, the I's are uh, dotted and T's crossed? Good question. Right. If you're a small uh, business like a lot of uh, family farming operations are and they don't have the internal staff, you know, the labor lawyer, the HR specialist, uh, it, there's a lot of helpful materials I mentioned earlier online. You can go to the Office of Foreign Labor Certification at the Department of Labor for in terms of the application process. Uh, there's lots of frequently asked questions and answers. So while a lawyer may not agree with the answers, at least if you go there and look at the way the government is answering it, you'll know what they're looking for. You'll know what their expectation is. You'll know what the issues are. So a lot of free material. Same thing with the Wage and Hour Division. Um, in, of the Department of Labor. You go onto their website under the various laws, whether it's H-2A, the Migrant Seasonal Agricultural Protection Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is the wage and overtime law. There's lots of good, helpful information that you can find out. And uh, same thing uh, you know, with ICE, with the, the I-9 form, the handbook for employers. If your staff, and they're in the times when they're not so busy, spend the time doing that and then matching up your policies and your practices with what you know the government is going to be expecting. That's a, a way to do it without necessarily having to hire a lawyer or an outside expert to come in and do it. Having said that, however, you know, when in doubt, I mean, we've had clients who have bit the bullet and hired outside help to go through the process. And, uh, and it's a matter of looking at your records, if you have policies, what's being done, looking at the documents, looking how long you're keeping records. There's record keeping requirements that are required. Uh, how you're keeping time records, all of those things, that it's going to pay dividends because it's a question of investing a little bit to make sure that you're squeaky clean and know what you know is required and expected of you uh, rather than just being surprised by a, an unannounced or three-day notice uh, audit and basically getting caught with your pants down and having a lot of exposure. So either way, is a good way. It just depends on best what's what best suits the, the business's needs and abilities. Last question, Monty, and we'll wrap this thing up. Uh, uh, several years ago, uh, certain states, and I probably don't have them quite right, but Georgia, Alabama, Arizona, I recall, uh, passed state laws that uh, kind of piled on with the uh, federal uh, laws here uh, in regards to uh, undocumented workers. Um, how has that experience uh, turned out in terms of impact on agriculture uh, in in whatever those states were? Well, I, I think the probably the best example is Arizona. It was the first. Uh, there were cases that went up to the Supreme Court on the ability of states to impose their own E-Verify, which is the electronic verification of employment documents required at the federal level. Those laws have been upheld. Um, uh, a lot of the big employers and small employers in Arizona have been forced into E-Verify, and uh, as a result of that, because of the demographics of the workforce, uh, they can't find enough legal so-called U.S. workers. 
So they've been forced into the H-2A program, and uh, that has been a very horrific experience for them. Uh, they're audited constantly. Um, the litigation has been crippling and costly. Uh, Georgia was a poster child, but they uh, basically, that law, the way it has been implemented, is provided somewhat of an agricultural exemption. Uh, otherwise, that would have been devastating for Georgia. And during that period, you're absolutely right, a lot of the migrant stream was avoiding Alabama and Georgia, who had the very draconian laws in South Carolina also. So there's no question that's had an impact. There's no question that E-Verify at the federal level is a matter of, it's just a matter of when that happens. Uh, the last Congress, it, this is moving fast and got derailed. Uh, it is part of the major reform bills uh, that have passed the Senate and uh, have been reported out of committee in the House right now. So it, it's inevitable. Its use has uh, expanded substantially among uh, employers in the United States. And it's the Achilles heel of agriculture. If we don't get a workable program to pair up with e verify uh, just as we've seen in the states, it's going to be very crippling to uh, agricultural employers throughout the United States. Well, thank you very much, Monty. Uh, I wish we could uh, wrap up on a more optimistic note than that, but uh, I don't know how we pull a silver lining uh, out of this issue other than to uh, remind folks to uh, check their own internal compliance, uh, do the absolute best they can. Uh, and if the uh, inspectors show up to uh, call their attorney and immediately and get some help. Is that a fair wrap-up on this topic? That's spot on. Thank you. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being with us today. As, as usual, you do a great job on this uh, topic, and we appreciate your uh, leadership at the national level on uh, work to get a, uh, a workable guest worker program uh, for farm employers across the country. With that, I'm well, going to hand you. it back, uh, Chris, for any uh, final wrap-up uh, details. And again, my thanks on behalf of the uh, Farm Credit East team for participating today. We hope you'll let your, your local uh, branch folks know about the usefulness of these webinars, including any uh, future topics that you might like us to uh, deal with. Chris? Okay, thanks a lot, Jim. Um, just to, to answer a question that came in several times during the presentations, the presentation PowerPoints as well as the recording of the presentations for those who missed this webinar will be posted at farmcredities.com slash webinars, as is information on all our current, past, and future webinars. Um, our next webinar is coming up on Thursday, February 27th at 10 a.m. It's called Navigating the Grant Process. Our own Nathan Rogers will walk us through um, various examples and opportunities in federal, state, and regional utility grant, grant making. Um, so that's coming up at the end of this month. And I'd also like to invite you to participate in our Pulse of Agriculture survey. Um, if you participate in the Pulse of Agriculture survey, you'll be entered to win one of four $250 Visa gift cards. Um, information and the link to participate in that is on our homepage, farmcredities.com. And with that, I will sign off and thank you all for